Hello everyone, welcome to another Cooking Connection virtual cooking class. I'm your host tonight, my name is Scott. Uh, I'll be with you for the next hour. Joining me as always is the infamous chef, Charlotte Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. Sorry, that's the way I have to say her new name for her contract. There's a new way I have to emphasize her name when she's moderating. Charlotte Samuel, uh, thanks for being here, chef, as thanks always. Thanks for having me. I feel like I'm on a game show now. Yeah, you kind of are. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of what we're going Look, for. I also... I'm going to troubleshoot. This is, I'm about to give the news. I'm about to deliver the news. I did the same hour, thing. To the teleprompter. Same <laughs> time. No words. <laughs> <laughs> Shuffled my papers too. People can't see me. All but. right, guys, welcome. Uh, we are excited you're here. We're excited you joined us on this Wednesday night. It's hump day. We got a good, uh, good night of recipes for you. Some great things to put in your uh, culinary toolboxes. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun. Uh, I'm especially excited. I'm a highly excitable guy, but uh, this one's especially fun because I'm gonna kind of show you. This class is kind of like Mediterranean, but um, we're gonna put a graphic up on the screen that's gonna show you. As we talk about the Mediterranean like area of the world, like the Mediterranean Sea and the countries that surround it, I think most people kind of think in their minds like, okay, the Mediterranean is kind of more Italian or Greek or you know, something like that just has that kind of, you know, it, it's in that range. But honestly, um, the graphic will go up and you just let me know when it's there so I can stop pointing it's at that. It's there. It's there. So you can see the countries represented in and around the Mediterranean Sea that all kind of border the Mediterranean Sea. There's so many different countries, obviously France, Spain, um, Egypt, Tunisia, you've got so many great countries that are all Israel, Lebanon, Turkey, Syria, like there's so much rich like food history along this part of the world and we, uh, we talk a lot about, I know Charlotte who's our nutrition expert and when she, we had the, uh, the dietitians come in they talk a lot about the Mediterranean diet. Well you can see that along the Mediterranean there's a lot of different uh, types of food and there's a common thread that kind of weaves all these together and Charlotte will you share a little bit about when we talk about the Mediterranean diet we're not talking about just hey I eat Italian I go out to Italian restaurants I eat Mediterranean like it's different from that right yeah Can you so explain a little bit about the kind of the Mediterranean diet before we dive in sure 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 so the Mediterranean so there's 22 countries that border the Mediterranean and there's um, they seem they seem to have more of these blue areas is what they were calling them or they have people that are blue living, zone. blue zones, thank you, um, that were living past 100 and they have a low incidence of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and so they did a bunch of research and they said, well, what is it about these countries that, um, these places that um, are supporting these, these healthy lifestyles, yeah. right? And so they, they? they did a bunch of research and they studied it and they found it was these um, types of foods, so not necessarily recipes, but these common foods um, in all of these regions that people were eating. And there was right. a, um, an emphasis on um, unsaturated fats, so like the, the olive oil. Good olive oil, And yep. um, so legumes, so like chickpeas or lentils, something like that, um, which are high in fiber, good Love source it. of protein. And then um, the diet is really rich in fruits and vegetables, right? So very plant forward, but not necessarily plant based. And of course they still- And um, they eat red meat, right? They're yeah, still, they, they still eat red meat, still have fish, they still, you know, they drink wine, but it was all of these, these ingredients, right, as a whole that have contributed to longevity and a healthy lifestyle. I feel like I live in my own blue zone in San Antonio because I drink copious amounts of red wine and I use extra virgin olive oil like ketchup. Um, I use it on everything, so I've kind of got my own blue zone. Now there that's not, uh, it's not a sanctioned blue zone. I just call it my own blue zone. Who knows how long it'll last, but that's what I like to do. Um, and kind of tonight, what I want to take you through is kind of a typical night uh, of stuff that I like to make for, for myself and my family. Um, it's really simple. Um, what you're going to find is a common theme throughout a lot of these recipes is they're, they're while they're, a lot of them are Mediterranean, some of them Lebanese, um, some, some influences in Spain, some influences in Israel, um, some sort of North African. Um, there, there's a common thread is that there's a lot of spices that we don't realize, and I, I think I've said it before, that your palate speaks way more languages than you do. And I think when we think about the cumin and like you think Ooh, about I your like bowl that. of terlingua chili, you have your, uh, you've got your cumin, the coriander, like the, some of these, these other flavors, the onion, the garlic, like there's all that great stuff. And so there's a lot of common threads in a lot of that Mediterranean cuisine that, that we share a lot of. And I think a lot of it, especially spice wise, um, but a really like really just good spice stuff from, from pepper spice to just like good spices. Um, and I love that stuff. So on the menu tonight, what you should have in front of you before I give you the news, we have our homemade yogurt pita. So the homemade yogurt pita, this is a sidebar to the, to the rest of the stuff. Homemade yogurt pita is really, really simple. So pita is kind of every, everywhere, every region has their own kind of, uh, I would say, a leavened style bread. And this is like uh, everything from the 
Um, we said earlier the non bread, which is kind of Indian style, uh, you know, just flat bread, um, the pita bread, the Arabic pita bread, Greek pita bread. There's all these different Italian pizza. Like there's a common kind of thread in all these. And so this is kind of meant to be that can be anything, but we're going to kind of define it as just a really tasty dough that you can use in many different applications. So I like it in this one. Now there's a pita pocket. The uh, Greek style pita is more flat and doesn't have the pocket in the middle, whereas more the Arabic pita has kind of more of that pocket in the center. That's kind of this, that's just kind of a broad scope basic, like kind of pita 101. Um, however, you can use this dough to get a pocket. The pocket in the pita is all about the steam inside the pita and how you roll it out. So pita pocket, like if you're gonna make the kind of pita, it's gotta be rolled really, really thin. So we're gonna do a couple. If your pita doesn't rise or get the big pocket in the center, practice makes perfect. Do not fret. The dough is still delicious. It will still serve all the purposes as I'll show you tonight, so don't worry about that. And I like to say, like, the ambient temperature for bread to rise, the perfect thing that feeds the yeast is between, like, the 85 and 90 degrees. If you start to go over, like, I think it's 121 or 130, the, the yeast dies, so that's the perfect temperature. I don't know about you, but when it's hot, and I live in Texas, uh, I don't keep my thermostat at 85 or even 90 degrees. Um, I don't care about the, the price of like, hey, San Antonio Water Spice says, hey, you can cut your favorite out. I like it chilled, like I like it cold. I don't go as cold as Charlotte. Charlotte keeps her place 69 degrees. I go about 72 to 73. But my point is that that is not necessarily ideal for growing the bacteria and yeast, like going, getting the yeast fed. So it may take longer to rise depending on where you are. Now, if you're outside and you're doing it, the, the yeast may rise very quickly depending on the ambient temperature. But typically, the rising can take longer. So don't get frustrated if you see, hey, within 30 minutes, nothing's happened. Just give it longer. It could be the temperature of the water, the temperature of the yogurt. It was a little bit colder. So a lot of things play into that. So we'll kind of go through that as we go. So the yogurt pita will do first, followed by the uh, toasted pine nut and lamb meatballs. Now, if you're saying, Scott, I hate I'm not a lamb guy. I don't like lamb. I had a bad experience with lamb. I totally get it. Um, we are going to be using the HEB natural lamb, which is a domestic lamb, which is really, really good. Um, I am also not a huge fan of the, uh, the more, I would say, the more Australian and New Zealand lamb because they tend to be a little more, I think, have a bit more of that gamey kind of flavor to them, although it can have a gamey type of flavor to them, versus the domestic lamb, which is a little more, I would say, fat forward. So it's really, really good. It works really, really well. If you're like, absolutely not, Scott, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to force you to do anything you don't want to do. A so, more mild lamb, we would say. Mild, right? mild lamb, which is that, a great word, okay. mild lamb. You can always use ground pork, ground chicken, ground turkey, ground beef, ground bison. If you're going to use one of those leaner meats, like a bison, a chicken, a turkey, or like a 97.3 ground beef, um, I would double the amount of water in the recipe just to make sure that your meatball stays moist and doesn't just kind of tighten up. Because I want these meatballs to be moist and not the kind you can take out of your driveway and bounce all the way down your driveway in your neighbor's yard. Don't do that. So in this, uh, some fun things. So where are we similar as far as where this meatball kind of goes toward a Mediterranean or Middle Eastern style flavor and what we do, like we would do like for a normal meatball here if you're going to make like a chorizo meatball or whatever it is. So some similarities are we do have a little cumin, garlic, onion powder, um, great flavors. We're using a little coriander. The one spice that's kind of tilted a little off is the allspice. Again, that allspice. Allspice is a big flavor. So I kind of said earlier, and we had a laugh about this, uh, and you may not laugh, that's okay, I can take that. Um, allspice is that spice where, if I did all the spices together, you can see that like it's equal amounts of cumin, the coriander, the garlic, the onion powder, the salt and pepper, but when the allspice comes in, allspice is that, just imagine he's that like, hey, I'm here, I'm allspice. Like he's just that, I don't know why he's Italian, he, he may not be Italian, but I'm just saying like, <laughs> he's, he's a big flavor and he can make everything else go like, is there cumin in here? Like he's a big personality in the room. So we wanna make sure, we don't want him wearing his blue velvet tuxedo suit coming in with a microphone and a megaphone. We're toning him down so that he comes in and just adds to the overall flavor and just gives it that little nuance of that thing where you kind of go, ooh, I really like that in there. If you left it out, still be good. But with it, it just tends it to a whole different level. So the pine nuts as well. I love pine nuts in this recipe because it gives it a little more texture, it gives it a little more crunch. And honestly, it's a great cocktail meatball as well. So if you want to eat this for a main dish, absolutely. You can also roll these smaller for a cocktail meatball. They've got the little, uh, all the great herbs in there, the mint, the basil, not the basil, the mint, the cilantro, the parsley, all that stuff together just really complements the lamb really, really well. And those pine nuts is just dynamite. So I'm going to show you how to do those. We're going to fry some, and we're going to bake some, and I'll tell you a little trick on how to bake them the right way to get them nice and crispy. The grilled baba ganoush, it's as fun to say as borosilicate, and you know how I love to say the word borosilicate. In fact, I'm gonna be using some borosilicate bowls later. Uh, the grilled baba ganoush, really, really yummy. It's literally five ingredients, you can see. Eggplant is the star, so I think what gives baba ganoush the flavor, everybody kind of goes, and if you're not a fan of eggplant, I promise after you try this, you will be. 
Uh, the flavor of the Bagbo ganoush is like a, the people call it like a smoky flavor. And it's not that it's smoked, it's that you char the eggplant to death. And so all that great burned like kind of skin and all that char just contributes to the, to the, to the inside of the flesh that we're gonna use. And just gives that really nice kind of smoky charred flavor. It's amazing. It's got tahini, like one of my favorite things about um, this kind of cooking. Did you know how Just that put was? that anywhere, chef. I, I didn't realize it was balancing. I'm sorry. The, you know, the pita chips blocked my view, so I apologize. That scared anybody at home. Uh, I love tahini. Now, if you've not used tahini, tahini in this dish is literally the same thing that it does to hummus. Like, so the tahini in baba ganoush is going to give it that whole other nuance of flavor, just like when you have your hummus, that, that flavor, that just kind of that craveability. Like there's a lot of great flavors we sell at HB of hummus, but that tahini is that one thing that runs through them all because it just gives it such a beautiful flavor. What is tahini? Tahini is a ground sesame seed paste. So it's a little similar to peanut butter, but not quite as wet. Um, it has a great flavor. It's a little bit bitter. It's a little bit tangy. It just has a phenomenal flavor and it just flavors so many things. So if you're not a, a user of tahini, I would say start using it and just start introducing into things. It's fantastic. Um, I love to use tahini in my, um, my when I make my, what's the thing you like, Charlotte? It sounds like it's tzatziki. got yogurt. Tzatziki. Yes, tzatziki. Okay, but it's Chef, fantastic. what is yes. black tahini? So, black tahini is just like you've seen at HEB. You walk in, you see the white sesame seeds. There's also the black sesame seeds. Get out. So, black tahini is just the ground black sesame seeds. It's a little more watery. Um, you cannot find this at HEB. Uh, if you have a central market in your neighborhood, you can probably find this at Central Market. Um, I just brought this to show you. There's a, a new tahini that's also there. The black tahini is a little more, I wouldn't say a little more bitter. They're both simple, but it's like to make like a black hummus or something really cool to give it a really unique flavor. Like yeah. if you're going to add it to yogurt, like if I was going to use a black tahini in my uh, tzatziki, it'd be super cool. It'd almost turn like a charcoal looking. It'd be really, that really, really, really cool. yummy. Anyway. That's more product development later on down the road. Um, but yeah, so tahini is really great. We're going to use it a couple different ways. Um, it's fantastic in the baba ganoush. Again, four things. We're going to throw it in the blender. Typically, I'd love you to do the baba ganoush in a food processor, so it's just a little smoother, has a, but has a little bit of texture to it. Since I don't have a food processor that's less than the size of this table, I'm going to use my trusty blender here. We're going to get that going. Finish it all off. One of Charlotte's favorite salads, the fatouche, Lebanese-style fatouche salad. It is my favorite summer style style. style. Tile? Style. There you I'm go. I'm going to try style. Let's go with style. We'll save tile for later. It's my favorite summer style salad because it's got fresh cucumbers. It's got radishes. Um, the dressing is so simple because all we're going to do is take a little fresh garlic, some lemon juice. We're going to throw the, the, the garlic and the lemon juice. Let it kind of like cook. Let it kind of just chill out a little bit. Let it simmer down. Take the edge off that garlic and that's going to get mixed with olive oil. So it's literally lemon juice, garlic, olive oil. It's fantastic. Sometimes simplicity is the best thing in the world for a lot of salads. You don't need to overcomplicate it. Um, what I also love about this salad is we're going to add a little fresh parsley, a little fresh mint that gets tossed in there. So that great menthol. I can't say menthol when I think about mint because I think about like a pack of cools. And I'm like, it's not really like, <laughs> I don't want to make the comparison no. between a pack of cigarettes and fresh mint. No. Quite a different story. I'm sure nutritionally they're probably also very different. Um, yes. So yeah, so we're going to start with the, uh, so that's on the menu. It's really, really simple. A couple things I've got going on here. I'm going to show you a couple different ways of how to do the yogurt pita. We're going to start on the yogurt pita first because it's going to take a little time. Um, I went ahead and preheated an oven to about 500 degrees. Now, if you were with us in our pizza class, I don't have a pizza stone. And if you don't have a pizza stone, if HEB doesn't sell a pizza stone or a pizza steel, you're okay. My trick is throw a sheet pan, flip it upside down, just a cheap $4 sheet pan, flip it upside down in your oven, preheat the oven to 500 degrees, get it super duper hot, and that way you're going to create a nice hot platform to cook your pita on. So pitas, depending on how you roll them, can be done in the oven. Some people do them in the oven to puff them up. You can bake them in the oven, or you can do them in a, I'm just gonna do them in a really simple cast iron pan or cocina ware pan. Both work great. Again, it's all about the rolling. We're proofing some. I've got some in various stages. So you can kind of see how we're rolling them out. It's really, really simple. Let's get started. I wanna show you, uh, I don't know what other pita recipes look like online. Honestly, I get my inspiration from looking at uh, like, cultural recipes, different recipes from restaurants, like what are they using, and I kind of try to go from that. Um, I like to use Anna Napolitana, Napolitana flour, double O, please. Uh, I love this flour, we sell it at HEB, it's fantastic. Reason being, it's a low protein flour, it's fine grind, it's unbleached, 
And there's not a lot of it, like if you're just going to use it every once in a while, I'm using four cups, about half of it, you can still make your pizza, you can still make something else with it, it's a great dough. And I'm going to use this also to kind of flour the actual pita so with later. So why would we want a low protein flour? Because I don't want this to be like, you know, some people say you can use bread flour for pizza, you can if you want that chewy texture. I don't want this pita bread, I'm going to cheat and show you this ahead of time. I don't want the pita bread that I've made or the, you know, this kind of pita, I don't want it to be so, I don't want to have to like struggle to chew it. I want it to be really, really soft and pillowy. And so I want something that's got less gluten so that there's less of that like chance for ah, it to like- more tender. Really robust. Yeah, you gotcha. don't want it so, you don't want it so, you know, hard that you're- Now, gotcha, gotcha. I did char off a couple of my pita because in the, the biggest thing about the fatouche salad um, in the Arabic culture is that the fact that they're using the Arabic bread. So those leftover pieces of Arabic bread, which is your favorite part of it, which is when you take the fresh pita bread that we're gonna make, we toast it, over toast it in the oven so it gets really, really crispy, but not so crispy it doesn't have some texture. That gets chopped up and out of the salad and as that liquid kind of goes together, it's gonna be, make a beautiful dressing and it's gonna all adhere to the, uh, Ooh, I can't to the wait. salad. It's gonna be delicious. So I need a big bowl. All right, okay. first in, water, one and a half cups of water. Again, a pretty well hydrated dough for what it is because we want to make sure there's enough steam. Let me do this first. Wet ingredients. Olive, Aww. Aww. <laughs> olive oil and honey. That's all right. Watch this. Because you know what? We put it in a pan, so all is not lost, Charlotte. That's, that's okay. why we put it in pans. If that was the first time that happened, man, that'd be one thing. But this is, happens all the time. Actually, I'm going to save this. The yeast is going to go in. So I've got yogurt and yeast. If you like a more yogurty dough, so watch this. This is how we're gonna do this. Oh, you're just gonna dump. Okay. I see yeah, where you're I'm going like, you didn't this. beat me, little pan. Try to get me off my game. Look at you rolling with the punches. Uh, the good thing is because we have the olive oil with the honey, it's not really gonna stick to the pan very much. About three tablespoons of the olive oil. Now, olive oil does two things to this. Number one, it's gonna help kind of tenderize and also help prolong the shelf life of the actual dough itself. But it's also going to serve as a as a flavor enhancer, right? So it's gonna be a little flavor enhancer. It's gonna help the dough last a little bit longer. So oil does to dough. So I'm just gonna mix this up. Now I let my yogurt come to room temp as everything was kind of sitting here. So my water's at room temp, my yogurt's at room temp. It's just gonna help this bloom a little bit faster. If you're using cold work yogurt, don't worry about it. Um, if I could give you any advice, if you're not gonna make this tonight, or you're not gonna use it tonight, you can make it one day, the night before like we are right now, and then make the dough, roll it into a ball, spray a little olive oil, cover it, put it in your refrigerator, because this dough, with the addition of the yogurt, which has all those, of course, the bacteria, right? Those good bacteria, those good gut bacteria, this will act as a, like a natural kind of, not sourdough, but it'll act as like a flavor enhancer, and it's gonna help ferment that dough and give it a really nice flavor if you let it sit longer. So if you can, always make it, you know, the night before. All right, flour. So I've got my sea salt and my double O flour. It's gonna go in. So why sea salt? I think if, we've, if you've been in one of our classes before, we talk about this. Whenever you make breads, you can, kosher salt sometimes has those edges to it, and so it can be a little big. So when you're making a dough, I don't want the kosher salt to cut my dough and make gluten, so I'm gonna use a fine sea salt. Um, you can use iodized uh, salt if you want, if you want, all you have. Iodized uh, salt is fine. Um, I'd cut back by like a, a full uh, half teaspoon though, because iodized salt is definitely a little saltier. So sea salt, again, it's just gonna work with it because salt actually helps form the gluten, but it can also kill the yeast, but it can also help build the yeast up. There's a whole lot of, baking is fascinating, by the way. And it's it, it, just when I think I've got my bearings and I feel like I know what I'm doing, it just it, it pivots and you can do something else. All right, so you just see, I'm gonna, now you can use a, uh, a stand mixer. Honestly, unless I'm making brioche, I don't really ever pull out my stand mixer to make dough. Um, I like mixing it by hand because I like the way it feels. By the way, the yogurt and the olive oil already smell amazing. So you can see I'm just kind of like moving around. This is going to be a little bit stickier. This will be a dough that should stick to your hands a little bit. And that's because we want a little more, again, that we talk about like the hydration rates. I feel like you just, I feel like I was just um, KitchenAid mixer like shamed for making no. dough. No, no, okay. no, 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 no. Let I feel this like you not just, be a shame. I do it. I Let definitely this not be throw my dough in my kitchen a with the dough hook and walk away for a little while. You can okay. do that exact All same right. thing. Just making sure. Just for those of you that don't want to pull out your kitchen aid or you don't have a kitchen aid, this is just showing you you don't need one to be successful at this okay. recipe. Okay. Well, Boom. that's actually very beautiful dough. It's really, really simple. So I'm just kind of, you can see, I'm just kind of slapping it in here. So I'm going to kind of let this sit once it's all kind of mixed in there. And this is where your, uh, your handy little flexible bench scraper comes in. Get this all off my fingers. So how long did I need that? As long as I was talking to you, three minutes maybe, not very long. 
again, we don't want to build up so much gluten that we're, you know, like chewing pizza or, you know, you like chewing pizza or like a bread. We just want this to have a little bit of give to it, but still have enough structure to kind of hold together when we're cooking it in the oven or we're throwing it in a little pan. So that's all I'm going to do here. Just kind of fold it on itself, let it sit. I'm going to cover it with a wet towel. That's going to go in a warm part of your kitchen. Again, if your kitchen is cold, don't worry about it. It just may take a little bit longer. So I usually put my dough to rise in my, like, in an oven with the light on. Yeah. Right? But if you need to have your oven preheated for something else, do not put your dough in there. Just put it maybe in a warm spot. Sometimes yes. on top of the refrigerator is a good place. To I am go. glad. Yep. Yeah, I am really, really glad you said that because the best proofer, so we have a phenomenal proof box here at our test kitchens because we do a lot of different events. Um, if you don't want to spend $1,300 to go buy your own proof box to use once a year if you're going to make bread, uh, I would encourage you not to. Um, simply take your oven and keep it off. Do the light on like Charlotte said. Boil some water. Put a little bowl underneath in the bottom of the, on the bottom of your uh, oven. Pour the boiling water in there and shut the oven. So that ambient temperature is going to go up to about 100 to 110 max. Boiling water is 212, but as it sits there, you're going to create a number one, a moist environment in your oven, and it creates a proof box to where the temperature will be between like 90 to 100 degrees. It's a fantastic way to make use of your oven, like a proof box, and just let it sit. That's the way I do my brioche as well, because I don't have a fancy proof box. So how long you know. is our dough going to, so... So I'm going to let that sit for 30, we'll check on it in 30 minutes. Okay. Everything was room temperature, we should see a little something. If you don't, don't worry, don't panic. Every once in a while, even though these say, oh, I forgot to tell you, I'm using platinum yeast. Why am I using platinum yeast? So there's regular old Red Star dry yeast, which is fine. You can absolutely use a dry yeast like that. Um, it works. Whenever I'm using like a higher fat, so I'm using a full fat yogurt, I like to use a platinum yeast, especially like when using like, when using like doughs that have a lot of butter or eggs or whatever it is in a rich dough. I like to use platinum just to give it a little more umph, just gives it a little more V8 power to it as it's kind of ramping up. So especially with that full fat, a little bit of the olive oil, there's a little more going on in there. So I want to make sure it has enough coverage to get going. All right, so that's gonna sit while that's going on, and I have various stages of pita to show you as we're doing this. Let's do the uh, toasted pine nut and lamb meatballs. Make it my little mise en place here. All right, so I love, love this dish. This is one of my like, uh, and I totally agree with you, Charlotte, this is one of those ones where uh, you'd be very well served to have some tzatziki on the side. Um, yes, we've really been talking about tzatziki all day. I love tzatziki. So Dang. a really quick tzatziki, this is how I would make it. Take one of those, I think they come in two-third two -third ounce packages of fresh dill. Take fresh dill, fresh parsley, cucumbers, rib out the cucumbers, chop up the cucumbers really, really fine, chop up the parsley, chop up the uh, mint, chop up the uh, dill, mix all those together with yogurt, a couple cloves of garlic zested, a little bit of lemon juice, that's it. Toss it all together, salt, pepper, nothing else needed. All right, so the, uh, this one or this one or this one? Oh, look, it's Wolverine. We're coming back to this. Um, if you have been practicing how to use two knives, congratulations. Uh, please don't cut yourself. Be very, very careful. Um, if you want to learn this fun trick that uh, has served me well over the years, uh, grab your, always grab your knife right by the bolster, which is where the handle and the, uh, the blade meet, the bolster right here. Pinch it between your fingers, wrap your fingers around it. Reason why you don't want to hold your knife like this is because if I'm chopping, I could, my wrist can turn, right? It's fallible. So if I wrap my finger around it, it's a lot stronger when I'm doing this, so it makes sense. So if I'm going to use two knives, I'll introduce the bigger one up front. So I'll take my fingers, just like this, and you can see that, Rob, and I'll add this guy to it. I'll still keep my finger back and just kind of wrap it. So now I have my finger, my knuckle using as a space. Notice if I turn, my finger's not out here where I could chop the end of it off. It's safely tucked back underneath, so both of them, right? So I'm so safely tucked underneath. All right, actually, that's going to be too big. It won't touch. It's okay if y'all don't touch. feel comfortable won't touch. doing Wait. this at home. Hold. He is most certainly right. showing off right now. You can still chop just as good with one knife. It just looks more cool with two knives, right? All right, so I've got a little fresh cilantro here. So a little fresh cilantro. So I doubled the recipe, so basically I could just use one bunch of fresh cilantro instead of using like a half a bunch. So I'm going to use one bunch of fresh cilantro. Now, as, as fine as you want to dice these, you can. Now, I also do when I'm in a real hurry. Um, I don't recommend this, but you can. If you want to throw all your herbs, your eggs, your water, and everything else in the blender along with the spices and blitz it up to form like a paste, and you can just pour everything over it and then add your pine nuts and your breadcrumbs, you can do that. I don't recommend that simply because... Uh, Let's do this with one knife first. And then, because that way it just kind of gets a little muddy and it doesn't have that bright green color like with using these herbs. I have All a right. question for you. Yes. Um, 
Ask for away. For fresh herbs, how long do you think they would keep in the fridge? I say about one week if you keep them dry and in the crisper yeah. drawer. So this is how I do my herbs at home. Um, I take my herbs, I'll rinse them off real good, and then I'll wrap them in a wet paper towel and put them in a Ziploc bag, and then put them in your storage crisper, and usually they'll last a week, maybe longer, depending on uh, you know, how fresh they are, but that way it just stays a little bit damp, and there's a little bit of, there's like a little bit of dryness, a little bit of dampness in there, just so it kind of keeps them a little better, and that way it kind of keeps the roots protected. I kind of wrap it around the roots a little bit if I can. But honestly, I use herbs so much, I like to use them on everything. So I'll keep them, I keep them on hand and just throw them in stuff nightly. Even if the recipe doesn't call for it, you can always use fresh herbs. All right, that's a lot of herb, yeah? Look at that. This is, this is where that double knife comes in, right? You know how long it would take me to chop these with one knife? About the same amount of time. All right, so the meat, here we go. I'm gonna take my used knife here from the herbs. I'm gonna score the back of my Look at that container. technique, that was clever. I never thought about opening it like that. It saves a little bit of time with the criss -cross your hands from getting so. With the back? Crisscross effect? Yeah, there you go. Watch I'll tell this, you, everyone. I'm learning every day I'm here. Ed, did you see that? That's every something I learned. Every day we're I hustling, learned. every day we're learning, right? All right, ground lamb goes in. No extra lamb hands. I'll put my gloves on in a second. All right, so. I'm gonna get the spice mixture next. So in here, again, we have the, I have cumin, coriander, garlic powder, onion powder, allspice. Remember the allspice? Hey, how's everybody? He comes in loud, it's obnoxious. We wanna make sure we tone him down a little bit. He's very toned down in this recipe. I'm gonna throw my pine nuts in. I'm gonna throw a little bit of my panko so bread crumbs. So Tompkins, how old were you? How, how old were you when you? How many years old were you when you found out that allspice was one spice? Oh God! Uh, it probably was like not till culinary school. Yeah, right. All spices. I'm like, yeah, add all the spices. All the spices. They yeah, just add really all the spices, all and you're like in your car cupboard going, "Are you sure you're supposed to add all?" all it says all spice. <laughs> add all your spice. I know I'm not the only one. All right, eggs. In. Make a big old mess here in a second. Wipe my hands off. We try to be as food safe as possible, but just know everything gets cooked and then thrown away, or it gets composted. Uh, I think we did, uh, one of the shows we were doing, one of the cooking uh, classes, we had a lot of, I think I had a lot of produce stuff, and I just kept chopping it and throwing it in the garbage. It all got composted, it all got composted. It just looked very wasteful the way I was chucking it because there's not a lot of room back here where I am. So we kind of make do with what we have. All right, let me get my board a little sanitized here because I'm gonna cut some vegetables on a little bit later, but that's all right, I didn't cut any meat on it, so we're all right. All right, now comes the fun part. Just where you get your hands in there. Now, if you have kids that are in trouble and your lamb is very cold like it is, this is a great punishment for your kids to have to mix all the meatballs. I'm saying if somebody was in hot water, this is where you could do it. Otherwise, this is just a, uh, a fun thing. You ever do that, Charlotte? Is that how you punish Ren? Make her do chores you don't want to do? Is that no, how you do? No, that's like punishing myself. If I was like, <laughs> go ahead, Ren, mix all these meatballs. There'd be meatballs on the ceiling, meatballs on the She's fridge. She's like, okay, Mom. I'll do that for you. Yeah. All right, just give us a quick mix. And then she'd like go and touch other things with meatball she would. hands. No. I, uh, hang on, I forgot my water. Wait, 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 wait. So this is a and technique that I see you use a lot when making meatballs is you yes. add water. Some people Correct. add like a piece of bread soaked in milk or whatever. Yep. Like, um, old school, yep. Yeah. Absolutely old school. So it just water. adds moisture to it, right? It just adds an extra moisture. Now you may think like adding water in here, you're like, oh, it's weird. It's not gonna, it's not gonna, you know, hold it all in. It won't suck it all in. It absolutely will. It holds it all in. It's gonna help distribute the spices a little bit better. Look how pretty that is, though. It is beautiful. All those big herbs in there we're gonna have. Now my recommendation for you is once you get it all mixed into where it's nice and homogeneous, what you want to make sure of. How do I know when I'm done mixing meatballs? If you don't see any more of the little pieces of meat just on their own sitting there like that haven't been mixed, then you're pretty much good to go. So you have a still a little bit that's kind of not quite mixed. Just kind of keep mixing it. Probably could have used a bigger bowl for this job, but I thought I'd challenge myself to see just how much stuff I could leave on the side of my board. All right, that looks pretty good. Uh, I started saying that my recommendation is let this sit for a little while. Reason being is you want to make sure that all those spices, uh, we use a lot of dry spices in this. You want to make sure that they have time to kind of set up. Uh, and they'll bloom a little bit because those dry spices, obviously, because they're dried, when they kind of rehydrate with everything, 
it'll kind of waken everything back up. So not long, like this is where, I'll paint a picture for you, an ideal scenario. So this is where you mix your meatballs, and then you say, hey, uh, I'm gonna go get a glass of wine. That would be a 10 ounce pour, one glass of wine. Glass of wine, you're letting this a sit, you have a little pour. conversation. Okay. You start prepping your other ingredients like we'll do. This sits, 20 minutes later, you're ready to go. Cover this, in the refrigerator it goes. We're gonna let this sit for a second, and we're gonna go to our baba ganoush. So the baba ganoush, again I said five simple ingredients. I'm gonna add something just because it's Texas and I know we like a lot of heat in Texas. Um, I have the ingredients of this baba ganoush are, of course, eggplant. Um, it says two large eggplants. So what is large, Scott? It's a great question. Um, oh, look at this, okay. So two different eggplant, but I bet if you stretched them out, this guy could be larger. He's just circumference differently. So we'll call these guys large. That'll work for our purposes. Um, every once in a while, HB, which I love, they will have those baby eggplants. I don't know if you've seen those, those little baby like eggplants they carry. Those are fantastic. If you're gonna use baby eggplants, uh, I would use the whole bag, which is usually like four to six in there. Just use the whole bag and you'll get about the same yield. Um, to prep these, we are going to destroy these. I'm really sorry, fellas. This is just how this has to go. Uh, we're going to maximize flavor on these guys, so we're going to put them on our... So it says grilled. I yes. am going to grill them, but I'm going to use our Cocinaware little grill plate. So on the other side, there's a flat plate. You can do like pancakes or whatever. If you haven't picked this up yet, most HEBs in the GM section carry these. are fan well, I have my grill side of the plate heating up over about a medium to medium low heat. I'm just going to kind of take the top off of this guy here. Just kind of scrape this guy off. And I'm gonna cut this guy right in half. I'm not gonna trim him anymore. I'm not gonna do anything else. I'm not gonna season him. I'm gonna spray it with a little bit of, of nonstick spray. And then I'm going to throw them right onto the grill plate and get them nice and charred. So what am I looking for when I, when I talk about charred? Like these are going to be so charred that the skin itself, which is a little bit thicker, which usually you'd wanna shave off if you were doing like chicken parm or whatever, you'd shave this off or eggplant parm. You'd shave it off, but <laughs> this is where, uh, they want it, you want them to like, they'll start to like cave in on each other, the sides, and then you'll get a lot of liquid starting to come out. The reason being is we want to char this, it's gonna get nice and char, but all that beautiful flesh inside of this has such great flavor if you just let it char, let it char. I know it's gonna seem weird, you're gonna be like, it's too long, too long, it's burning. Let it go and I'm gonna show you what that looks like. I'm also gonna show you, for those of you that have a, uh, a little nonstick spray, you can brush with a little olive oil, whatever you wanna do, um, I'm just doing this for One time. of our viewers, Ed, says he's never seen anybody uh, behead and eggplant that way. Really? And uh, he wanted me to thank you. And also, I want to comment on that well as well. I was impressed with Be that method. Usually, I just like hack it, and half of the top, half of the eggplant comes off. Hey, you just give it a little. So you can see those are I on like the grill. That. I'm gonna let those go. A little oil on those. So we're gonna we're gonna really really cook those very 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 well. Um, those are gonna go for a little while. I already have some made, some baba ganoush. So if it, if it turns out that we need to crank up the the heat on that, we can get that going. Uh, in our blender though, I did talk about the blender. So I'm gonna move this up here for a second. Whoop, 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 before I break my meatball bowl. Here we go. I'm telling you, when I say we work in tight spaces, we work in tight spaces. Uh, all right, here we go. Gloves, recipes. So I have the eggplant here. I do wanna show you, for those of you that have a gas stove at home, one of my favorite things to do, especially here at work, we have these you know, 56,000 BTU stoves. Um, charring the eggplant this is a great way if you have extra coals left over from your fire if you're gonna barbecue take your eggplant out take the the, the uh, grill the grill plate off and throw these right on the coals let them just sit there and that flavor it'll just ember the outside of this and it'll just get so blistered and so beautiful and then just scoop them up scoop out the flesh put it in whatever you're gonna do or save it and use it later um, I'm gonna put one of these guys on there I don't know if Rob you can see that is that a better one to go That'll work. There we go. All right, watch this. Oh my gosh. Catch it on fire. All right, that's going to go for a little while. I'm going to leave the top <laughs> on. This is just going to go. I'm going to let it sit there and roast. It is going to get really, really, really destroyed. Why do I keep saying that word? Number one, you don't hear that word a lot in cooking, and I just like to say it every once in a while. So cooking, this is going to get completely uh, battered and bruised. I've got a listen, pair of tongs over listen, there. Listen, Maverick, you're just too dangerous. You're just flying too dangerous over here. That's right, Iceman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so I've got some tahini. So tahini, I told you, was the reason uh, for this whole recipe. Like this is, this is what makes baba ganoush baba ganoush. Besides the chard, making sure I'm following along here. You guys, you guys are with me. Um, I'm gonna use a little more tahini than you should. 
Um, and I might say a little bit. I like the flavor of tahini. If you want to do it, keep it at the fourth cup. I'm going to use a third a cup, and I want to show you how this looks. So see, not quite peanut butter and jelly style peanut butter, but if you did use this on your peanut butter and jelly sandwich, it would probably be delicious. Again, a little bit of that bitterness. If you're allergic, definitely don't use it. I mean, I guess it would be considered like allergen free. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's, I don't think there's as many allergies. I'm not, again, I'm not a, I don't work for the CDC or for an allergy uh, center by any means. So I say this just based on my knowledge of things. Uh, I don't, definitely don't think that the sesame allergy is as high as the peanut allergy. I could be wrong on that. So Ed says if he cremates the eggplant, I'm going to laugh. And I think that's the point, right? I think you're going to like. That's the point, Ed. I'm going to cremate it. I'm also going to laugh, gonna see Ed, but I think <laughs> I'm going to laugh. I think that's. I like that. See, people cheering on. See, it's yeah. good. I, I don't mind failing in front of you guys because that's how, that's how we get better, right? We just, we just fail and we get better. All right, for garlic. So if you don't like garlic, if you think garlic is a, a, a dirty word, then you don't have to use this. You can always use shallots instead. Um, I'm going to use the, uh, I'm going to go for the uh, three cloves. It says four cloves, but if you have really, I have, these are really giant cloves of garlic. So I would say mostly if you're going to use the four cloves would be like this size. Four cloves of garlic that size, a little smaller. You can see giant garlic. This is after Thanksgiving fed garlic. This is like pre-Thanksgiving garlic. So I'm going to use these three guys. I'm going to throw those in there and I'm going to wait until the, until the eggplant's done. So the eggplant's going to have a lot of moisture. It's going to have a lot of water and it's going to help this blend. If you realize, because I'm using, I would use a food processor in a blender, it may need a little bit of help. Um, I doubt it'll need as much help in a Vitamix, but in a regular blender at home, like my little $14 one I carry at home, uh, it may need a little bit of water. Just add a little bit of water to it if it needs it. Otherwise, there should be enough moisture in the parsley to kind of get the whole party rolling. All right, so that's that. I'm going to show you this. You ready for this? Ed, this is for you. So you see how the eggplant, see how that, it's staying. It's going to stay there for a little while. It's going to get charred. It's going to stay, it's going to get, start to get really gray. It's going to start looking a little bit ashen. It's going to look a little bit sad, but I don't want you to lose hope. It's going to be delicious. I'm going to move this. Oh, and I did say, because it's Texas, I'm going to add a little heat to this. So I'm going to add a little Serrano. So because on a scale of one to a hundred, I'm about a four on the heat index scale of what I can tolerate, uh, I'm going to de-seed my Serrano pepper because I love the flavor of Serrano's, Thai bird peppers, I love all the flavor, I just can't handle the heat. So I'm gonna take this guy out of here. So I'm just gonna cut him in half, if you can see that. These gloves are fantastic, look at that. Ooh. All right, a little spoon here to scrape out the inside, and I'm going to throw this whole thing right in the <laughs> blender here. It's maybe a little hot. There's a couple more seeds in there. I'm sure everybody that uh, that's watching probably likes a lot of spice. I know I'm probably I don't uh, know. unique to the non-spice factor. It depends on the mood, right? Like, you're not a huge spice fan, though, are you? Do you do a lot of big spice? I, not, I'm not like going to take like the salsa challenge where you eat like. Carolina Reapers and no, you don't, you're drink not, you're the, do that. the cinnamon bourbon or whatever whiskey. They would well, never that, put cinnamon and bourbon. I apologize. Wait, is that a bourbon? Is, it, mean, is that Fireball? That, that's a name Fireball, for that, right? Fireball. Whatever, yeah. I thought you meant the cinnamon challenge where you eat a teaspoon of also, cinnamon. Also, I would never do that. Also, I'm never. I'm not going to do that either. All right, our baba ganoush is sitting there. Let's do the pita. Okay, let me show you this. So I have some pitas. I'm going to move this guy out of the way for now. I'll work with our dough. Move him over here. Again, I got a nice preheated oven. So I have two pitas that I rolled out. Now, how did I get to this point? I'm going to show you. Eddie, you watching my eggplant? He is. I he says it looks is, like man. it's getting a little sunburnt. It's getting a little, it's getting more than sunburnt. This is going to be charred on the face of the sun to where it's like third degree burns and then some. This, I'm not going to start moving this until I start seeing liquid pouring out of it, if that makes sense. On these guys, they're still there. I'm going to let those guys go for a while, and then I'm going to flip them over, and eventually, as I figure out which camera I'm in, eventually uh, the backside of that, just like I said, it's going to start to collapse on itself, and that's when I'll take them off and get them going. All right, the dough. You will need your wooden rolling pin, which I have somewhere. Oh, I put over. it in your bucket of tools, chef. But I think I then moved it to somewhere. Well, then you're on your own now. There we go. Together, we make part of a team. All right, so I've got some of the dough balls. Now you can see these are, uh, so I, this is really, really important. I want to show you this. Whenever you make bread, so you see how I push it and it does not respond, that's ready. That means it's as proofed as it's going to get. 
If you touch it, and it kind of will bounce back on you, but if you can leave an indention when you touch it, it's ready to bake. So this is ready to bake. I've got a little flour set up. Again, I'm using the double O flour. I'm not going to change flour. I'm going to just flour it a little bit so it doesn't stick. And I'm going to roll this out. I prefer this kind of rolling pin. I just like it a little better because that way I can take my rolling pin on, this, on the edge of the table and just kind of roll it. And all we're going to do is just kind of roll it out. Now, I am terrible at shaping this in a really nice way. Now, if I, if I did this every day for a month, I'd be really, really good at it. I would tell you I could roll you a perfect circle, but I can't always roll that. If it sticks, don't worry about it. Just keep rolling it. If you need a little more flour, just do a little bit more flour. Both sides. Again, you don't want to stick. And you're going to get it really, really thin. Now, how thin? About a quarter of an inch thin. So it's really, really thin. Again, if it doesn't puff up, it's not I a, think those are a, words to live by. If you need a little bit more flour, just put a little bit more flour. Just put I a little more flour, that. right? All right, you, you see this? All right, that, that's rolled out. Before. So at the same time, I'm going to throw, look at this. Oh, yeah. Oh. Come on, Ed. Look at this. Can you hear that? It's like a crackle. It's a little bit of juice coming out. You see that? Ed, I secretly wanted him to catch it on fire, but alas. Eggplant Ooh, really, won't, it really won't catch on out. fire. It's kind of like a that. pepper. Like it has a really, that skin is really, really thick. Good, so I'm sorry to disappoint. Now, Ed, if you want me to, I can catch something on fire, if we can. I can pour grease all over the tabletop and we can catch that on fire. All right, so you see I got beautiful, beautiful marks on here. That's more what I really wanted these all to look like. This right here, that's what you want. See how I touch it and it kind of just dents in? That kind of dents in, but it's still a little bit more. So I'm going to let these go. I'm going to destroy them a little longer on that side. This right here, see how soft it's getting? See that? Oh, yeah. This is where I miss. Now, I have a 1979 coil stove, uh, pre-World War I, I'm assuming, that they brought off some ship and put to my house. That's what you want. See how it's starting to split now? That's where we're at. All that good flavor. We should kind of smell the smoke in here. It's really, really getting smoky. All right. I'm going to spray a little cast iron pan. Wait, one more time. Just, if you need a little bit more spray, add a little bit more spray. Need a little more spray, a little more spray. All right, I'm going to take this guy off. Here's our, I'm going to deep, I'm going to de, uh, de kill or de destroy our eggplant here because I can definitely use him in part of our thing here. Look at this bad boy. Yeah, come on, Ed, look at that. I'm okay, sorry, I'm did you say de kill or de, de so you're going to bring it back? You're going to resuscitate. Yes. Resuscitate. Hence the baba ganoush. That's where he's going to be, re, he will be revived. Now my cast iron pan has been on for about three and a half hours, so mine's really hot. So with that in mind, I'm gonna do this. I sprayed my pan. I have a tendency always with these kind of breads to automatically always start treating them like pizza dough and start doing it and start doing the crust and start getting that going. And I don't wanna do that. So again, if it doesn't puff up, it's okay. It's gonna be like more Greek style. So we talked about this earlier. My pan in the oven, really, really hot. I'm going in. This pan right on top of that pan, instant heat. It's going to start to puff up. And then you just keep rolling them out. Just a little flour, a little flour on top. Again, practice makes perfect, right? If it sticks, don't worry. We're going to roll them out. Bob, can you see this okay? You see yeah. it all right? Yeah, overhead cam. There we go. All right, rolling it out. Just rolling out the pita. Again, Greek style if it doesn't puff up, no big deal. Or the Arabic pita pocket here. Practice will get you there. That's why I love this guy. You keep it on the side of your board. And you, just you know what I want to sing right now? What? They see me rolling. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Can you? I, I, Who I, sings I did it? it. Will you give us a fuller version? I need I to hear the full not. version of my That's head. That's the only so part I, I wanted to say. Realize. All right, per the recipe, 20 seconds. That's been about 20 seconds. You see how there's a little bit of air in there. So before those turn to big bubbles, it'll pop. I want to flip this guy over. See if I can start making those bubbles puff up. Can you see the bubbles in there? Yes. Starting to see them? So you can kind of manipulate this a little bit without popping them by kind of moving the bubbles around and they'll kind of like start to push their way a little further. That's a way you can kind of, you know, manipulate a little bit. But you can also do it. See that big bubble? I'm gonna try and see if I can get them to, to move. It'll puff up again. Start to kind of move them. Again, not a big deal. It's really hard. It takes a little practice to kind of get them to the point where they will, uh, they're all so even and flat enough to where that steam inside will just kind of puff them straight up. But you see the beautiful little bubbles, we're good. It's really, really tender. I can feel it in my hands, it's really tender. These in here starting to go. All right, I got one more here. I think I got enough pita going to get us going here. All right, what's missing? Baba ganoush is doing its thing. I'm ready for my salad. The fatouche salad. My fatouche salad. Okay, let's do this. 
Can you go light-ish on the garlic? Because I want to have some of this for dinner tonight. I don't know, Charlotte. That seems like a pretty tall request to go light on the garlic. Go Charlotte garlic. Charlotte garlic. Not Tompkins, heavy-handed, 4,000 So how many, how many cloves are you, are you asking for? Just one or two? Just one or two, yeah. OK, I'll go one or two. We'll go light. I got you, Chef. I got thanks, you. Thanks, thanks. Right, about Look 20 more seconds here. We're going to flip again. You can see our little bubbles. I do want to show you on this next one, those little fermentation bubbles. If you let it sit longer on one side, you're going to get all those little bubbles, those little fermentation bubbles from all the yeast and all the water kind of trapped, all the gas. You're going to kind of see them puff up. And I love that look, too. It'll give you more of that kind of speckled kind of burn look. All right, fatouche salad. So we have to have pita for the fatouche salad. And I did tell you I charred a couple of pita. Hello. Pita calling. Here we go. Pita, right here. Here we are. I'm going to go with the big knife here. So it is soft enough to where I can still slightly bend it without it just crumbling into pieces. If you are going to avoid pita altogether, if you're like, I don't do pita, I'm not going to make the pita, Scott, no big deal. Go grab yourself a bag of the H-E-B pita chips. You can throw those in there. The reason why you have the pita in the salad is because there's a lot of very juicy ingredients. Cucumbers, tomatoes, the herbs. Once that salt hits our iceberg lettuce, it just starts leaching all that moisture out. So I want to make sure that whatever I'm going to use, I need something that kind of sops it all up, which is the reason why we're not going to add the dressing or season it until the very last second. We're going to toss it all together. So, I mean, it's like, come on, in any salad, you add some crunchy business, like a yeah, crouton. And it soaks up like, some of that bread. Like, what are you supposed bread? to do with the leftover, like, the leftover bread? You make croutons, so exactly. leftover pita. Leftover pita. And it's really, really good. Look at this. So we would all really of have this, no leftover pita at my house. All this is going to make up the base of that. I'm going to put this at the bottom of a big bowl here because I'm going to toss it all together and I'll plate it in a really nice bowl. But for now, I'm going to put it all in this big guy here. You want more pita? I got one more that's charred. You want to do another pita in there? Want two? Yes. All right, we'll do two. I'll do two pitas. I got my other pita here. Again, nice and... I, Eddie, you see, and I'm not... I'm not even stressed about the eggplant. I'm let it do its thing. I told you it's going to get destroyed. I need it to get destroyed. All right, I'm going to cut our. Sorry, Rob, is my head in the way? Does this work? This works. Everybody can see pretty well. Top of my head. There you go. All right, this. That's a pretty pita, good haircut, man. <laughs> it's pretty tight, right? I mean, I, you know, I do my best. What I do, Charlotte, is how I do it to get your hair like this. You put on a blindfold, take a pair of uh, shears, and you just kind of just like you got to just feel it. And when it feels right, you just, you know. All right, garlic. So in this, I'm going to use a little fresh squeezed lemon juice. That's our dressing. So the garlic, I'm going to go light. I'm going to use a little bit of our garlic. Where's my zester? My I did pita not bread. get you a zester, but there's one at the end of this table right here, chef. Got it. Oh, you got it. Just kidding. Pita okay. bread coming off. That one's good. This one's going to go on. Get this guy out of the way here. And that happens. A little thing. That's okay. <laughs> Pam Leave says, love grilling eggplant. You can get through a good half bottle of wine while you're <laughs> ignoring it. Yes, <laughs> Pam. Exactly. Do you know Tompkins? Do you, <laughs> she, I had, there's a lot of kindred spirits out there for, uh, for my, my kind of blue zone living. You know what I mean? There's a lot of that. Uh, I don't know if that's enough garlic, Charlotte. Okay. Feels, do, did you do one or two? Two, but it feels... If you need like a little more. bit more garlic, add a little bit more garlic. It's okay. You know what? We'll leave it like that. I'll leave okay. it like this for now. I'll throw it in here. I'm going to add a little lemon juice. Um, I could squeeze the lemon juice, but that would be ridiculous when we make a little fresh in store lemon juice. Put in this little container here. Uh, a little bit more. There we go. All right. Now, what's that going to do that's going to take the edge off my garlic? A little lemon juice. You see my pita over here? Look at this. See how it's puffing up? So... I'm going to let this, I'm going to try and manipulate these bubbles to see if I can spread them out a little bit or I'll pop them. <laughs> That's totally fine too. All right, but flip it over. You can see it puff up again. Really, really tasty no matter what goes on. This is going to sit aside. That's going to be our dressing. Remind me that's there later, Charlotte. If okay, you have not how's used... that piece of pita you put in the oven? What's that? The pita you put in the oven. They're show. still going. We're good. Okay. I'll show just, you right just now. Just I usually can smell those when they start to get a little bit... Flip them over. That one's got a little pocket to it. They're still really good. You know, however you do it. Two slice heirloom tomatoes. I love using heirloom tomatoes. I love using in this recipe. Um, the one thing I'll tell you about heirloom tomatoes is, is there's, there's a trick to how you 
how you slice them because I think most people feel like you could just slice them like this and you kind of, but then you're left with this weird core in the middle. So for aesthetically pleasing, and I'll do this, I'll make sure you can see this Rob in my thing here. I'm gonna take our bread knife and I'm gonna cut them from the bottom. So you see how I get those beautiful little pockets? It looks a little prettier. And that way I can, I can carve off the rest, but I've got nice little flat things to work with here. So when I'm chopping this, I'm gonna go back to my big knife. I'm gonna Man, just- Man, those are beautiful. I love good heirloom tomatoes. Now, if you can't find an heirloom tomato, one of my other favorites is uh, using those little baby, like those baby heirloom, baby grape tomatoes. The little baby San Marzano tomatoes are also fantastic in this. Um, any one of those you want to use, you can. We just got our knife sharpened. It seems like that skin's a little tough, but this knife's not as sharp. Um, you can use uh, those, any of those baby tomatoes are great too, if you'd rather. I like to use these because I love the flavor of these. Um, and when they're around, I'm always buying them. Man, if y'all are growing tomatoes out there, those would be- It's hot enough, right? This is right? like, if you're growing tomatoes, I think this is like prime season to be getting bushels of them off your, out of your garden. I can't grow tomatoes. I killed our rosemary. Actually, the snow killed our rosemary. Really? Yeah, I can't grow anything. We, I don't grow much of, I don't have a, what's called a green thumb. I have what's called a no thumb for produce. This guy doesn't want to get on there. You see him, he's running around my board, Rob. What is going on with this guy? There we go. All right, we're gonna do a little cucumber. So I love the English cucumber because I can keep the skins on. Um, I have nothing against, I don't have a bone to pick with regular cucumbers. I just feel like these cucumbers are vastly superior. How'd that feel, cucumber? That feel, that feel like a personal attack? It didn't mean to feel like one. I just wanted to let you know my feelings on English cucumbers. I'm gonna dice these small again. Again, you could chop these into circles. You could chop them into half moons, however you wanna do it. I'm gonna kind of keep them the same size as, what am I doing with that cut? Do you see that? Woo. Wait. Right, I gotta spend some time cutting some cucumbers, man. I'm rushing here. I'm like, these are like, man. I remember these blindfolded. my first time. <laughs> I remember my first time cutting a cucumber. <laughs> you know what it was? Uh, that's karma getting me back from the regular cucumber comment. <laughs> All right, a little bit of cucumber here. Man, you're not gonna take the seeds out of those guys? No way! I, you live dangerous, man. I, man, especially in these. Why We don't need to in these, man. You don't, but They're still. They're not as juicy. They're not as juicy. They don't have as much, uh, again, nothing against the regular cucumber. Vastly superior to an English cucumber. You know what I'm opinion. saying? Like, okay, there's a time and a place. So like a traditional, like, conventional cucumber, it has that like waxy, really thick skin. Like if I was gonna do a dip, like if I wanted to dip that into some hummus, yes, I yeah. want that big old cucumber. But if I was gonna put this in a delicate salad, I would prefer this cucumber. I, uh, I prefer these cucumbers all the time. You won't find those wow. other cucumbers on my table. Noted. All right, uh, I would go crazy and add a bunch of cucumber to this, but I'll keep it light. Um, in, the, in the fatouche, I like to do uh, a crisper kind of lettuce. Um, I think romaine is fantastic. I already took a little the edge off of this, but I like something that's a little, that'll stand up a little heavier to the, to the actual salad itself. We're gonna have some radishes in there, so I'm gonna Cut this guy in half. Um, People I, give iceberg a bad I love iceberg rap, lettuce. man. I love, I iceberg. love iceberg lettuce. It's one of my favorite lettuces. Same. It's basically water. It's, basically it's crunchy it water. It is crunchy water. God figured out how to make crunchy water. Well, I mean, there's also ice. The, he, he did that yeah, I mean, one he did, too, but like, we have ice. cool. All right, a bunch of this. I'm throwing it in real, real big again. Um, you can Get call that iceberg. lazy cutting. We also like to call that rustic. Um, this is all going to get tossed in there. So my herbs are going to go into the last second. I'm going to chop them and put them on top, but I'm not going to stir everything. My radishes, I really want to talk about radishes because radishes in this are fantastic. Is that good? Is that, would you call that oh, burned? There you go, Ed. Ed. I was counting on you, Ed. What happened? On two accounts. The good thing is, Ed, I burned both of them at the same time. How about that? <laughs> Oh, that's, we that's could call have put the those share. in something. That's what they call the angel share. All right, let's get these meatballs formed up here as we're about to wrap everything up. We are ready to go full tilt into all this. I'm going to turn off that. I got everything I need here. The radishes I'm going to add are like this. I want to show you this real quick because I love the radishes in the fact that you have, uh, we have this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stem on these. Now, radishes are really, really dirty, so you're going to want to wash these like crazy, but I leave, leave all this good stuff on there. This stuff, any of, this, any of these things that's not completely wilted or really trashed, leave all those great stems on there because when you cut them, when you cut them like this, you get that beautiful shape. So we have that beautiful little stem on there. I think it looks great and I think it's great for the salad. 
That's a really pretty shot. Little Radish 101. How fresh. It's Rob, man, all day. All right. Our fantastic herbs while our thing is heating up here. Now, again, I'm not going to go crazy. This is mint and parsley, equal amounts. Are you using the flat leaf or the curly guy? I like curly leaf, man. I know it used to be on every, uh, every little diner thing as a, as a garnish for everything that you would ever get. But I love the curly leaf in this. It's got a little more bitterness. I also love it because I think I love tabbouleh. Tabbouleh is like one of my favorite salads. I lived in LA for a long time and there was a lot of great, great places. It's such a diverse place. Uh, great culture, great food culture for so many things. Everything from Chinatown, Koreatown, um, Little Ethiopia, um, Little Armenia. I mean, there's so much great, great food. Um, and I loved all that and I love all the flavors. That was my first time I ever had tabbouleh. I remember being like blown away, being like, it's, and it was so simple to do. It was just like, I was just blown away. All right, the meatballs. Here we go. I'm going to see up these meatballs. So I'm using Charlotte's favorite tool. She's said this before, her favorite tool in it the is. kitchen. It's your favorite tool. It's the tool of how she vanquishes her enemies. It's how she, uh, so you see this? You see how much, see how that's, we're not there yet. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to leave that going. Again, this is going to be quenching on itself. A little olive oil in the pan. A lot of olive oil. Now, most people would say you shouldn't be using olive oil like that. I would say it depends on the kind of olive oil you're going to use. Like, I wouldn't use an unfiltered olive oil like that. That yeah. has, like, particulate in it. Nah, not so much. But a lot of, most extra virgin olive oils are a blend of olive oil anyway, right? They're a blended oil. So you're going to get a lot of that, like, a lot of them that have a really high smoke content. So, you know, they can do a little more than you would think they would. All right, I got a really hot oven. I'm going to let those guys go. So if you want to put these in the oven, you can absolutely do that. My thing is uh, they tend to get a little gray and a little bit lifeless sometimes. If you ever bake meatballs in the oven, you got to cook them a really long time to get them crispy. Uh, my trick is cook them to about 155 internal temp where they start to look gray and they're starting to get, put out some clear juice. And then turn on your broiler and just flame up the top of the meatballs until they get crispy and then flip them over and then recrisp the bottom. So I'm going to just do six here for our quick little meatballs into the super hot oven. I'll go right on top of the pan in here, get those crispy, wipe my hands off. All right, I'm going to show you how to use this eggplant. Our meatballs are going here. I'm going to wash my hands real fast. Food safe, always food safe. While you're enjoying this simple wash your hand break, shot it, sing for them. The what? You no? want me to sing happy birthday so that we know that you did it for the right amount <laughs> of time? I was saying you sing for them while I was washing my hands. Nobody needs deal. to hear that. You were the DJ earlier. I don't know what happened. Now we're all of a sudden we're, she's, she's, uh, doesn't want to sing in front of you guys, I guess. When I sing, all the neighborhood dogs start barking and howling. It's not good. Well, that's good though. So they're, bar they're like doing it in harmony, right? All right, here we go. Baba Ganoush. I have our delicious I'm going to use this guy and this guy to show you. Those meatballs smell delicious. All right, here we go. Watch this. Oh, hey, Ed says he's going to put the meatballs in the air fryer. I was just going to say, you're going to say air fryer. Good for you. That's a fantastic way to do it. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of cut around this here. Now, normally I would take my time and do a lot of like, you know, just pull out of the extra little burn pieces of skin in there and you can absolutely do that. But for this, this is all I'm gonna do for this guy. This is why having a flame really works well because all I gotta do is scrape this off. This is gonna be delicious because of the fact that uh, it has all those little burnt pieces. Now watch this. Boop, boop. And for this guy who's really hot. Did you also make the boop noise? Boop. Do we do it together? Okay, one, I wish two. you could smell this. It's, it's so oh. fragrant and like smoky. All right. This is going to get blended, not without a good pinch of salt. Yep. I realized as I reached for this earlier, this was sugar and I switched it out and I was like, I had a moment I was like, I may have just been sugar added to that. Add mm. enough, enough salt. Here we go. Remember, we got the, uh, we got the pepper in there. Show me you can do it, Vitamix. Here's how we do this. Move it around. Again, that eggplant's gotten nice and charred. It is nice and hot. Check out your meatballs, homie. I'm not bossing you around or anything. That's okay. 
It was needed. Meatballs. Another pair of tongs. All right, ready? Boom, Boy. Rob. That is what you want on a meatball. That's what I like on my meatballs, a really crispy skin. These ones in here are gonna be going for a minute. I right. would like to order one super toasted pita with baba ganoush oh, and gosh. some salad on top. It smells so good. All right, this is gonna go away. I don't need this anymore. My cutting board out of the way. I got some pita, I got meatballs coming. Our baba ganoush, here we go. Look how beautifully green that is. Now the longer that sits, the better it is. This one I can already tell you because we charred this. This was just grilled. This one up top here, as you can see, this one was, one was completely on the flame where I scraped the skin off. The smell of this is so much smokier than this one, it's crazy. So, so if you can do it on open flame, it's smoked. fantastic. Say it again, Chef. It's not smoked. It's not smoked. Usually it's just charred really well. Wow. It's really, really charred. I'm gonna keep this here because this is a good, this is a good one. We may need that. All right, the dressing. I said olive oil, lemon juice, salt and pepper. I need to flip my meatballs over again. How am I doing on time? I'm over, right? Am I over? No, you got plenty of time, man. I got excited talking about all the stuff, man. All right, here we go. On the back side there. All right, those are crispy. Here we go. Bottom of my oven. Heat proof pan. Finish those guys off while I plate up the salad here. And I want to show you a real quick trick with our pita. We have all this great pita over here. So on a plate, there's my salad bowl, my meatball bowl, and this guy. So I want to show you guys a great way to do this. A little pita. We got a couple different ones here. See how those little spots, those little bubbles that we said we done, but they're very pliable, right? So I could take my meatballs, I could stuff them in the pita, oh. and there's your Greek style pita, right? Um, if we had a pocket, this one had a little bit of a pocket, I could probably cut it open, it's deflated, that's what they all do. Uh, cut it open, you can stuff it in there. What I worry about with the pocket pitas anyway, in this kind of application, is that all that heavy stuff I'm gonna put in there is just gonna rip through. So I'd rather have a little extra insurance by having that foldable. Um, but, garlic, in. It already had the herbs, right? Enough olive oil. Because as soon as I hit this with salt, everything's going to start leaching out. How much olive oil is he going to use? A lot. So like Some. a lot of olive oil. That was about a, a third a cup or a half, probably about a quarter a cup Whoa. of quarter Salty. cup of blue zone. Remember my blue zone. My blue zone has oh, is, is oil sensor and salt. my blue zone, chef. All that oil, all that great stuff. Remember, we had the pita in here. So that's going to also soak up all that fantastic flavor. I put a little bit of garlic per the request. Wow, look how fresh this is. It's the herbs, it's the... Now, if you wanted to further texify this, you absolutely could by throwing a little crumbled bacon, a yeah. little roasted pepper in here. But I feel like just as is, it's so fresh and delicious. That's really all you need. Holy cow. Okay, so, so I want good. a layer of baba ganoush, please. And then some fatouche on there. Layer of baba ganoush? Yep. Do it. Ooh. Layer of baba. Y'all, this is like, seriously, we're making like a, this is like a Mediterranean taco. Oh, <laughs> so excited. Okay, some of that. Again, the bread. So look how glistening that bread is. It's just going to kind of keep soaking up that fantastic flavor. Nom, 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 All right, I'm nom. putting this up here. The rest is going to go in this bowl right here. Hang on, wait for it. The pretty bowl with the low sides. I would, I mean, honestly, to me, this is a meal right here. This would be all about, this would be all I need. This is the meal. Oh, is it going to fit? I'll save the rest as the kitchen share. I mean, just so you guys know, all, no food is harmed in the filming of these shows. We eat. Except the eggplant. You saw the eggplant get destroyed. Things. Ed, <laughs> you saw that. All right, this is this. This is this guy. Hang on. Let's do a little plating for our meatballs. I can smell them. They're coming out. They smell really, really good. I'm going to take half a pita here. I'm going to cut it in half. A little bit of our spread. And, piece de resistance, a meatball. Anybody else think I was going to grab that with my bare hand? Because I almost did. 
I was like, I'll just grab this really quick. It's only been in there for two minutes. It's going to be nice and cool. All right, here we go. Boop. How many want two? Two is good, right? Two works. Let's put this big fat guy right in the center of that bad boy. These will go back over here. Actually, I'll throw them back in here, keep them warm. All right. That is that, a little mint. Really, really easy to do. A little drizzle of this on everything. That is it. Mediterranean, my house to yours, really, really simple. Uh, really easy, again, nothing too complicated. The fatou salad, super, super simple. Uh, the meatballs are great. Again, nice and crispy, sear them off. Uh, the pita bread, meatball. you just practice. I just love that. Practice makes perfect. That's all you need to do is just keep going. And then obviously, char the heck out of your eggplant. It works really, really well. Those are still going. I'm going to make more baba ganoush out of those. Really, really simple. Uh, chef, thank you for being here. Thank you for, uh, thank you for moderating as always. Thank you for keeping the chat um, rolling. Uh, we want to thank you guys. If you always want to go back and watch Chef Charlotte doing this, we can pause and reverse as many times as you want to mm -hmm. do. The, uh, 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 uh. Go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash H-E-B. Check out all the past classes in the last six months, I believe, now we've been going. Long time, a lot of great content coming up. And if you want to sign up for future classes, go to our website, hebcom slash classes. Sign up for the next thing. And don't forget, next week, the Grilling Open will be live on YouTube. More details, go to our uh, website, hebcom slash classes. Thank you guys so much. Have a very blessed rest of your night and a great week. See you later.